when Scott asked me to preach this morning, um, he told me that the topic was going to be Bible study. And I was thinking, I mean, immediately got convicted because I believe that <clears throat> all Christians everywhere um, should be devoted to three things, um, chief among all the other ones. Prayer, going to church, and reading and studying your Bible. Um, church, doing pretty good at. Wednesdays, Sundays, pretty faithful. Prayer, pretty good at. But I got to confess, Bible study, uh, I have been neglecting. And so when Scott said, hey, look, I would like you to preach on the next chapter in the book that we're using, the Believe book, Bible study, I was like, oh, man, the Lord's trying to tell me something, man. I know it. Because a few weeks ago, Scott was preaching on worship. He didn't ask me to do the one on worship. I mean, come on, you know? Like, so... I was like, okay, God's trying to sell me, tell me something. Well, anyways, the topic of Bible study isn't necessarily one that invokes um, passion or excitement, you know. Um, and so while I was writing this sermon, I was trying to think of ways to make it interesting so that it wouldn't sound like a seminary lecture or something like that. So trying to find ways to make Bible study interesting. Here it goes. <laughs> um, if you... Spend one, just a moment online Googling Bible study, you're going to find a billion different topics, books. There's entire, literally entire volumes of books written to the study of the Bible. Seminaries, excuse me, seminaries are built uh, to study the Bible. Uh, we've had 2,000 years with some of these scriptures. So we've had them, and even the Old Testament, even longer. So we've, we have volumes and volumes and volumes of stuff written about the Bible, how to read the Bible, uh, which ways to read the Bible, how to approach the Bible. So it, to put that in a sermon, I, I, uh, I had to really distill a lot of things. And so what I tried to do with broad strokes, we're going to go over two main things. Why we read and study the Bible. And then the second one, <clears throat> how to read and study the Bible, okay? So these two main things, again, broad strokes, okay? So, why we read the Bible? The first one, to know God. I wanted to just, I mean, I'm going to be using scripture for all of these things, so um, here we go. I'm not going to read all this, don't worry. <laughs> Ephesians 5.22, this is where Paul talks about the uh, relationship that husbands have with wives as being the same as Christ has with the church. And so the metaphor is that the church, us, all of us here, we are married to Jesus. And therefore, we are in relationship with him. And just like a husband and wife have to communicate with each other so that they may, they may know each other and be in relationship with one another, so also we need to be in communication with our creator to gain intimacy. God knows us. He knows our likes, our dislikes. He knows what, is, what gives us passion. But we do, do we know that about the Lord? And we have the option to pray. We can, be, uh, we can verbalize our communication to the Lord. But oftentimes the Lord isn't audible to us. Not that he doesn't. I mean, if you hear from the Lord, by all means, that's wonderful. But the main way God speaks to us is through his word, his likes, his dislikes, what he's passionate about, who he is. And he's not ambiguous about it either. Here's the relationship. Okay, there's the marriage. Exodus 34, 6. This is when Moses is up on the mountain and he's getting the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And he says, Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you. And the Lord says, look, you can't. You, there's too much, you have too much sin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover your eyes and run right past you. And so that's why you see here. And he, the Lord, passed in front of Moses proclaiming, who is God? Here we go. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Who is God? This scripture is quoted all throughout the Bible because here we have God explaining himself to us. 
This is who I am. We have this, and you'll see this sometimes in the Old Testament where the word Lord is totally caps, cap, all capital letters. It's the Old Testament word for Yahweh. I am. I am the beginning and the end. The first and the last. Created all things, and all things are sustained through him. I am God. God. Now we have this word, compassionate. I am glad that I am in a relationship with a compassionate God. I'm glad that I know that. Gracious. You know what grace is? Unmerited favor. Favor that God pours out on you, even though you don't deserve it. Oh man, am I glad that I am in a relationship with a God that has grace. Slow to anger. A patient God. My goodness, I lean on this one a lot. I don't know about you guys, but I love that I'm in a relationship with a God that's patient because I am a mess, abounding in love. Has it just, he's got, it overflows his love for us. His love never fails. We just got done singing that. Abounding in love, faithful, maintaining love to thousand, forgiving. I don't know about you guys. I sure am glad that I'm in a relationship with a God that's forgiving. Okay. Now, all of this is wonderful. Then we get to this part. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So God hates sin, guys. This is the God we're in relationship with. He hates sin, and he hates it a bunch. Okay, and this was written in the Old Testament. Luckily for us, the New Testament, we have Jesus. And God poured out his hate of sin on his son. And if we claim his son... And we believe that he died and was buried and three days later was rose from the dead and that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, then guess what? We are saved from this punishment. We're saved from the rage and wrath that God has against sin. That's the God that we're in relationship with and I think that's pretty cool. Why we read the Bible? Number two, to know who we are. You know, oftentimes we read the Bible to find out and glean about things about who God is, but you know what? The Bible is also a mirror unto your soul. So we have the scripture in Matthew 13, 1 through 23. It's the parable of the sower. And if you don't know this parable, there's Jesus is telling a story about a guy throwing seeds. And some of the seeds fall on a a path. And they don't get, they they just bounce off the top because it's a path, it's hard. And so the birds come and they eat the seeds. Some of the seeds fall on rocky soil where they grow real fast and then the sun comes out and they dry up. That's S-U-N, not... The sun, okay. (laughs) Seeds, some of the seeds fall on thorny soil where they take root, but then they're choked out because there's weeds and there's thorns that that, uh, get all of the nutrients, and so they can't take root. Then finally, some of the seeds fall on the good soil and they produce a crop that's 100 times, 60 times, 30 times more than what was sown. And so, how we can use the Bible as a way the Bible can read us. As opposed to us reading the Bible, the Bible can read us and can be a mirror under our soul. Jesus explains the seeds that fall in the path of the birds. The seed is the word of God. And the path in the soil is the soul. And he says, this one, the path, means people with a hard heart. And they don't let the word of God in at all. And they don't understand it. And so the enemy comes and takes the word out. Some of the seeds fall on rocky soil. That means the people who have uh, hardness in their heart, but not necessarily like this, but they take the word in and they get excited about it, but then life happens and things get hard. Money dwindles away, health gets bad, and then you abandon the word of God and you throw it out. And then he says here, the thorny soil. This is when the word of God comes into their heart and it takes root and they get excited, but then worry, doubt. Fear, shame, it overwhelms and chokes out the word of God in your heart. And then he says here at the bottom, the ones that fall in the good soil, the soil of the soul that has been tilled and worked and ready to receive the word of God. This is the one right here that we're looking for. So the Bible is a mirror. Does anyone here have a hard heart? Is anyone here a give up and forget? When times get hard, does anyone here uh, ever get overwhelmed with worry or anxiety or shame? I mean, this is a mirror. Sometimes the word of God can tell us who we are. Also, some other scriptures. Some ones I just pulled out because I love them. 
Psalms 139, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Guys, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us, and he did it wonderfully. John 1, 12, we are children of God, children of God. I think that's pretty cool. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you were bought at a price. Man, God loves us. He bought us. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We have purpose, and we're a part of something. Philippians 3.20, our, our citizenship is in heaven. We're citizens of heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 119.105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We, by nature, are blind, and Christ came to give us light, and his word is a light and to our path. That's who we are. Why we read the Bible. Number three, to remind us that we can trust God. So oftentimes we'll be going through life, and like I prayed this morning, it's very easy to forget the things that God has done, not only in our life, but over all through time. And here we have the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were guys that loved the Lord, and they prayed to the Lord every day without fail. And these guys that hated him came up with a plan, and they, and they, they uh, a way to bamboozle Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they knew that they would pray no matter what. And so the king at that time said, if anyone prays to another god except for the one that I make up, the one that's made of gold, they're going to be thrown into a fire. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just keep praying. And of course, they get turned in. And here's the scene. The king says, I'm going to throw you in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Their life is on the line. They are putting their entire life in the hands of the Lord. Why? Because they trust the Lord. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And I don't know if anyone here knows the end of the story, but they get thrown into the fire. And they walk around the fire, and the king Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he goes, I thought I threw three people in there, but I see four walking around the fire. And when they came out of the fire, they didn't even smell like smoke. Not, not one hair burned because they trusted God. Why we read the Bible? To trust God. Elijah and the 400 prophets of Baal. This is when a time when all the prophets of God were being killed by the nation of Israel. Their own people were killing the prophets of God. And so the last one, Elijah, he says, I've had it. Either we serve God and he is the God that we serve or we don't serve any, we, we can go to Baal or whatever. But let's make a test. And he says, we're going to have an altar and I'll have one and you can do whatever you want. If your God is real, then your God will light a fire and burn up the sacrifice. But if my God is real, then he will do that. So the 400 prophets of Baal, they go crazy and they, they cry out and they say all these, one, these crazy things and it never lights. Never. Now, this is a time when they were killing the prophets of the Lord. Elijah puts his whole life in God's hands, sticks his neck out on the line. Why? Because he trusts the Lord. And see, we hear verse 38, after Elijah prays to the Lord, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and all. Also licked up all the water in the trench. And then the people when they saw this, they fell and cried out, the Lord, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, the Lord, he is God. You remember that soil of the soul that when it's sown in the fertile soil of your heart can reap a hundred times fold? Here we see it playing out right here. But why we read the Bible? To remind us that we can trust God. Number four, we get our nourishment from God. Now, this isn't the food like burgers and fries. This is kind of food, the spiritual food that we have, okay? Jesus is taken out into the desert after uh, he gets baptized to get tempted by the devil. And the devil says, hey, I know you've been fasting a while. I bet you're pretty hungry. Why don't you turn those rocks into bread so you can eat some food? And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy here. He says, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are made in God's image. When God gathered the dirt and then came down and blew into Adam, 
and made that dirt a living thing, what he put into Adam was his infinite nature. And we are children of Adam, and we have that in us. We have that eternality in us that cries out to be touched and satisfied by something that's eternal. Now, the problem is we try to fill that and satisfy it with finite things, things that are not eternal. We try to satisfy that eternality within us with food or Facebook or drugs or a workaholic whatever we try to fill it and it never satisfies you know why because only something that's infinite can satisfy the infinite nature that is within us and that is the word of god it satisfies it satisfies this is jesus with the woman at the well and he says give me some water and they started a conversation Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks the water from this well, they'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I give them will never thirst. Satisfied. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We get our nourishment from the word of God. Why we read the Bible. Last one, most important, because God tells us to. Guys, if we're Christians, we got to do what God tells us to do. It's that easy. If we're believers, we have to do what God tells us to do. And God says, read the Bible. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This isn't for just ministers. This is for all Christians everywhere. Joshua, this is Old Testament. Lord's talking to Joshua. This is the guy that's after Moses. Moses passes away and Joshua takes over the nation of Israel. God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey the law. The law back then is the word of God. The law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. I love this one. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. That's a nice little bonus, isn't it? 1 Timothy 4.13 Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. This is Paul writing to a guy named Timothy. And he's saying to him, Hey, until I come back, until I can come to you and be with you, Devote yourself to public reading of scripture and preaching. God says do it. So as believers, we got to do what God tells us to do. Okay? And there's all these other wonderful things as well. It's our nourishment, and it's a way we get to know our creator, who is, uh, who we are in a relationship with. So that's some of the reasons why. <clears throat> now we're going to go into some of the how. And again, we're going to have to paint with some really broad strokes here, because there are 2,000 years of books and studies and, and, and information on how to read the Bible. Guys, there is a lot of ways to do it and a lot of different opinions. So I really had to distill this, okay? So I came up with two things that I think have always been a way for me to approach the Bible and how to read it so that I can get a lot out of it, okay? There's a lot of other stuff, but these are some of the ones that I thought. So the Bible is 66 books. There's 66 individual books written in the Bible, that what we call the book, the Bible. Each one of these is written in a literary style. Okay? There are different literary styles of those 66 books. They're not all written the same. Okay? So we're going to go over some of the different literary styles. Some of the books in the Bible are written as a narrative. Narratives are the books that tell a story. These are the books like Genesis and Exodus. They're written, they were here, then they went there. Then they were here, and then they went there. Oftentimes in these books, you'll see like a big, huge, long genealogy. Uh, Methuselah begat Meshibaseth. Meshibaseth begat Hezekiah. Hezekiah begat Josiah. He blah, 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 blah. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And that is the nature of a narrative. He was here, then he was here. They were here, then they were there. It's a story. You're not going to have a lot of advice. 
There's not going to be a lot of emotion involved in a narrative. And narratives, you can take at face value. It's a story. If you were going to tell the story of your life, you wouldn't be intentionally deceitful. So you can take these stories at face value. If they say something happened, it probably did because it's a narrative. They're telling the story. This happened and this happened. Okay? The next one is the epistle or the letter. That's just what this word epistle means. It's just a fancy way of saying letter. Okay? So these are letters. Uh, these letters are written by, and I did this intentionally. Written, letters are written by real people intended to be sent to real places and to be read by real people. Okay? I want you guys just for a moment to think for a second. We're going to go into the future. If the year is 4016. Okay, today it's 2016. Imagine we're in year 4016. And they're digging up this thing, you know, you're on an archaeological dig and you find this big clunky box and someone says, oh, I know what that is. That's one of those things they used to call computers. Whoa, we found one. And they plug it in and it comes on and they start looking through some of the letters and emails. And this one guy comes across this email and it says, the cowboys slaughtered the cheese heads in the frozen tundra. And they all go, man, what are these guys talking about? Oh, I know. They're tribes. They're, they're the tribes and they were fighting each other in, in, in some place that was probably really cold. And he says, no, 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 no. Back in 2016 when this was written, there was gangs everywhere. And the, there's one gang that's a cowboy and there's another gang that's, that's a cheesehead and, and, they were, and, they, and they killed each other. Oh, no, 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 no. Still another one. No, these were schools. Schools and their mascots. And then the one guy says, no, no, no. They had this thing back then called football. And these were football teams. And the Cowboys was a team in Texas. And the, and the Cheeseheads was the Green Bay. And they probably played in Green Bay when it was cold. Okay? That's a letter written by someone to someone, a real person at a real time. So also, we read letters that are 2,000 years old. Some of the letters in the Bible were written in A.D. 60. That's, that's 2,000 years ago. Do you think the context is a little different now? Okay? And we also, we open the Bible and we say, oh man, God wrote this just for me. God wrote this just for me. Now, let me say this. God gave us the Bible, so yes, it is for all Christians everywhere. But letters were written by real people, intended to be sent to real places, and read by real people. We are reading someone's letter. Okay? So that's a literary style that the Bible, that has that, that's in the Bible. So we've got to take that into consideration when we read some of these. And there are a bunch of them down here. Next one, poetry. Biblical poetry, literature is emotion in print. It is emotion written down. And it's intensely introspective. Psalms and Ecclesiastes. This is Maggie's favorite. Because it's raw. And it's authentic. And it's painful. Some of the stuff that David wrote, he just, his heart is being torn out of his chest. And he's utterly alone. And a lot of this stuff is written like a diary. And I, I imagine a lot of the guys that were writing it didn't think it was going to be published for <laughs> generations to read. It's that personal. So that's poetry. And poetry doesn't share the same uh, definition of narratives. So you don't read poetry like you read a narrative. Do you understand? Okay. Wisdom. This is the deep and profound advice written to offer insight both in practical life and spiritual life. So here is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And some of the books of the Bible are going to overlap into different ones. Okay, so remember we're painting with broad strokes here. Prophecy or apocalyptic. Now this one I wanted to throw in because these books are often read as a narrative, but they are prophetic books. And I had to really find a way to define what these are. But essentially, these are truth-telling books. This is what I mean. Prophecy is telling the truth. A prophet is someone who tells the truth. Now, they can do it in two main ways. One, the first way they tell the truth is they reveal something that is the truth about the future that is hidden. 
events that we don't know about yet. So Daniel talks about a goat that comes from the east and flies across over to the west, and he's got this big giant horn. I mean, this is stuff that he was telling the truth about that we don't know until history unfolds and reveals that, that what he was saying was the truth. Does that make sense? Prophecy is truth-telling. Telling the truth about future events that are hidden to the people that are saying them now or then, and they are revealed as time unfolds. Then the second kind of prophecy is also truth-telling, but it's not about things that are necessarily hidden. A prophet of the Lord will go to a town and say, your sin is causing death. And the Lord is going to come and punish you. Two plus two equals four. There's nothing hidden about that. If you drink and drive long enough, you will crash your car and die. Is that a hidden truth? I mean, we all know that, don't we? If, if you take uh, hard intravenous drugs long enough, you will be taken over by those drugs and eventually they will kill you. If you... Um, you know, what are, what are, what are we, there's a bunch of them. If you have enough unprotected sex with multiple different partners, you will catch something and it may or may not kill you. But you, you expose yourself to that stuff long enough, then you will catch something. If you do this, then this will happen, and that's the truth. It's a different kind of truth telling, but it's prophetic nonetheless. And so that's why you have these prophets. These guys are the prophets because they're telling the truth. Hey, guys, the Lord is coming and he's mad. Stop sinning. That's the truth. And some of these guys are telling stuff like Daniel in Revelation. These are hidden truths that will be revealed in time. Make sense? And also, poetry should not be read as a narrative. And a narrative shouldn't be read as a prophecy and vice versa, on and on. So when you can kind of approach these books with the correct literary style that they were written in, it can add a lot of depth to the reading of the word. How to. The other one I wanted to talk about is context. Context is the who, what, when, where, and why. And this also, remember that analogy I told you about, it's the year 4016. We use the year 4016. Well, who wrote that letter about the cowboy, the cheeseheads? Who were they writing it to? What was going on at that time? Well, I, obviously, this guy was a football enthusiast, and, and he, um, this probably guy was probably talking to a friend of his because he was using these crazy words. So we can know who, what, when, where, why. It can add a lot of depth to the various passages and books of the Bible. Who wrote it? Where were they when they wrote it? To whom was it written? When was it written? What was going on during the time? You know, if you're reading the book of Hebrews, and you read that verse that says, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it cuts down and separates the bone and divides the truth. And then you realize that the book of Hebrews was written during a persecution, and the Christians were being burned alive just because they were Christians. And there were Romans going around knocking on doors and saying, are you a Christian or are you a Jew? And if you said you were a Jew, they went to the next house. But if you said you were a Christian, that meant you were going to die. And the Roman sword had two sides to it. And it was sharp. And so now you see the word of God is sharper than that. Than any two-edged sword. And it will cut all the way down to your bone. Gives it a little bit of depth now, doesn't it? A little bit of context can add a lot to reading of the word. Okay? So, you find out what the literary style is. And then you add a little bit of the context. If you go back to that parable of the soil, the discipline of studying and reading the Bible is a matter of the heart. If you can till the soil of your soul and spend some time in trying to figure out what it is that you're reading, who wrote it, 
What kind of literature is this? When was it written? What was going on at this time? And, and get immersed in it. That is a discipline that we can do where we can actually till the soil of our soul. So that when God comes and speaks to you through that living word, it can take root. It can take root. And it can change your life. And give you nourishment. And remind you that you can trust God. So I wanted to <clears throat> conclude with a story. There's a Vietnamese man named Hien Pham. I think I might say it that way. Hien Pham. Shortly after Vietnam fell to the communists, he got picked up um, because they accused him of being a Christian, which he was, and that he helped the Americans while the Americans were still in Vietnam. And so they threw him into this communist uh, re-education camp. And so they were just indoctrinating this guy with Marx and Engels and communist propaganda, and they were trying to tear all of the, the stuff that he learned from the Americans and democracy and freedom. And also they took his Bible, his family Bible, that he read because he was a devout believer. He prayed every day. And it, this went on for days. And they actually gave him, because he was a believer, they thought it'd be funny if they put him in charge of the latrines. And so, you know, this was, at, you know, a, in a place where there was like an outhouse, but it was elevated. So you walked up and then you went and did your bathroom break and it would go down into these buckets. And Pham was in charge of the buckets. So he had to go dump the buckets, clean them out, and, and that was his job. It was the worst job there, as you can imagine. And so, but he still prayed every day. After days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks of this going on, he finally starts and hearing that there is no God, that, that it's all made up, and that religion is a crutch, and that it's an opiate of the masses, and hearing all this stuff, he finally just says, you know what, enough. Enough. I've had it. I've, I've cleaned enough bathroom mess, feces, and urine. I've done enough of this. I'm, tomorrow is the last day I pray, Lord. Tomorrow is going to be the last day that I pray. Because where are you in all this? Where are you? So the next day he gets up, goes to the, pull the bucket out, and he notices one of the pieces of paper has writing on it. And so he grabs it and puts it in his pocket. Goes about his day, gets back to his cell, and all of his cellmates go to sleep. He pulls the piece of paper out, wipes it off, and found this. It was a page of his Bible that had been ripped out and used by one of the communists as toilet paper. And this was the scripture he read. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or communism or nakedness or danger or swords? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither this present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And Pham cries out to the Lord and he says, I'm so sorry. I can trust you. And his soul was satisfied. Etern eternality reached out and grabbed a hold of him that in that horrible situation and gave him the nourishment that he needed for another day and then another day. And as he went to the bathroom, he found his Bible page by page. The word of God. Nourishment. A way that we can know our creator. A way that we can know ourselves. A way that we can be nourished and satisfied. That's why we read the Bible. Let's pray.